Thank you, Kate, and good morning, everyone. It's fantastic to see so many people. My, my name is Andrew Mitchley. I'm from RSPB Scotland. I work on climate and land use policy issues, and I'm going to talk a little bit about agriculture and sort of wider land use. So I'll just see if I can share my screen with you. Um, hopefully this will work. Okay. So I'm hoping that you can see a screen that says land use, agriculture, net zero. I, I, will, um, I will just bash through this as quickly as I can, just to sort of make sure we have lots of time for questions. So what we, something that uh, Mary started with in the, in the starting session was the, the new context that we're working in. So the new targets are absolutely uh, sort of game changing in, 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 in thinking about what we have to do. So in, in the Climate Change Act, the targets to set net zero by 2045 are really stretching and really importantly the, the target for 75% by 2030 is, is really focusing minds and so what that does and I think it's, it's recognised across um, sort of civil society and in government itself that actually to meet that target of 75% by 2030, so re reduction emissions of, by 75% from 1990 levels by 2030, all sectors need to do everything possible as fast as possible. So the challenge is absolutely huge. Um, and then on top of that, we have recent events with coronavirus um, changing the conversation, thinking about how we're going to respond to that as well. So we have a, a really massive challenge. Now, specifically looking at land use, the Committee on Climate Change um, published a report on land use in January and they started, the very first sentence of their report was, net zero target can't be met will not be met without changes in how we use our land. And those changes have to start now. And so they looked at things like changing agricultural practices, afforestation, changing management of peatlands. And I'm gonna to briefly touch on some of those. So let's just think about agriculture to start with. So just a very headline, top sort of top line sort of um, thinking about agriculture. Ag we, we have to recognize that agriculture and related land use is the second largest emitting sector of greenhouse gases in Scotland. That's really important because we have to do something about it if we want to get to net zero. Um, and just to talk about, just to sort of add sort of context here, we're talking, I'm talking about land use as well. So the box at the bottom of this graphic is the sequestration. It's, it's, the, it's the carbon being taken out of the atmosphere. And um, in this instance, you know, specifically mentions forestry, but we can also think about land use change and so on. So what we have to do is we have to reduce the size of the agriculture box and increase the size of the forestry box to get to be on the way to getting towards net zero. And then I've just sort of laid on top of this a graph. So if we just look, I don't want to go through this in lots of detail, just look at the very right hand side, the second dot down gives you the line for agriculture. So it's a light blue line with squares. So agriculture is the second largest emitting sector, that's what that represents in, for the 2017 data. But if we look back through time, there has been a reduction in emissions from agriculture over time. It's been very steady, it's just been gradual, and, and what that actually re is related to is a gradual decline in the number of livestock in Scotland. So um, agriculture, in summary, agriculture is really important. We have to do something to reduce emissions, um, and, and that isn't to be criticizing agriculture is just a, a, a statement of fact. We have to do something in every sector. Everyone has to do everything that they can do in order to meet our targets. So where are we at the moment? So in the current approach that's set out in the climate change plan that still currently exists, it's going to be reviewed. Um, and, and unfortunately that was slightly delayed for, for very good reasons um, around coronavirus. But um, at the moment, the current climate change plan has um, agriculture in it. Now, unfortunately, there is a very low ambition for what we would be asking of agriculture to do. So there's a 9% expected um, reduction in emissions over the lifetime of the climate change plan. And that's in comparison to other sectors like transport, which was expected to reduce by 37%, and buildings by 33%. So agriculture wasn't actually being asked to do very much. And if you think back to that last graph where we have that long, slow decline of emissions from agriculture, actually, if you go back 15 years, there has been a bigger reduction than 9%. So thinking about the, the lifetime of the current climate change plan, which was thinking forward 15 years, if that trajectory carried on, the government wouldn't actually have to do anything and it would still probably meet the 9% reduction that it was aiming for in agriculture. So um, very low ambition. 
And then the, the second thing about the current climate change plan is that actually everything that's included in it, um, well, very few things actually take us very further forward because lots of it is about let's try and encourage people to change behavior by giving more information or sharing information or education and so on. So actually it all depends on voluntary action. So where do we get to? Actually, what we need is that we need a step change in the government's approach to agricultural emissions. We need greater ambition and we need to move away from the current focus on voluntarism. So what does that look like? Well, just on those two things, on ambition, colleagues in WWF Scotland funded some research to look at, well, how, how much um, could agricultural emissions reduce by? And they found that um, you could be looking at or trying to get a 35% reduction by 2045 without significantly reducing agricultural output. So that's, that's agriculture taking up all the things it could do, changing uh, practices to reduce emissions, but still maintaining food production. So that gives you just a sense of potential ballpark about aspiration. And at the moment, we're at 9%. And then what does a step change look like? Well, actually we have to put in place new policies. So we need to move away from voluntarism. So we start, have to start requiring certain things as a given. Um, so soil testing, carbon audits and things. The Committee on Climate Change has suggested extended, extending a uh, sort of a policy tool called Nitrate Vulnerable Zones to the whole of Scotland, um, which is um, a potential option for helping uh, limit or uh, encourage a very clear focus on the management of nitrogen. Um, what we actually need, um, the second bullet down in the new, under the new approach is we need, actually need a reformed agricultural policy which actually has reducing emissions at the heart of what it's about. Uh, until we get this, this change in approach actually will we'll just be um, sort of encouraging change, we won't be really driving it. But we can't, um, we have to acknowledge that it is a big change we're asking, so we do need there to be investment in a transformation in the agricultural industry, and we need to help that along the way. So we need to provide better support, better advice, better training, and so on. So it's a big change that's required. But and I think we, it's, we have to be completely um, sort of realistic here. We have to recognize that it is a challenge for the farming industry. So um, the Committee on Climate Change in their uh, uh, sort of approach to this said well what we need is all the farming to do everything but we also expect there to be other things happening so we expect there to be a 20 percent reduction in red meat and dairy consumption and we expect there to be um there needs to be a conversion of around about 20 percent of our agricultural land has to go to another use predominantly planting trees so if you're a farmer this is a really difficult thing because your markets are changing and you might need different um, put, you might have to put your land to different use, use different skills and so on. So it's a challenge and this challenge is compounded by the state of the industry. Now I'm hoping you can see this I, I, and, and it's a bit abstract. This is Sc the Scottish Government's farm business income data and the last bit on the right hand side, the last data point is for 2017-18. What that shows, the top green line shows you that the average farm income was £35,400. But when you take away the public money, which is given to, farm, to farmers and farming through farm support, actually those, the average farm is losing £7,400. So, so this gives you an impression of the industry. Like, there'll be lots of farms who are doing really well, and there are some who are doing quite badly, but on average, this is the position, is that there are many farms who are losing money without ongoing public support. Now, it's not a great place to be in if you want people to be innovative and change and adopt lots of new practices and so on. So the industry will need help, um, and, and that's something that we have to bear in mind. So what sort of change do we, we, do we need to see? Well, what we need is a comprehensive change in approach from government with reducing emissions at the core. The government has to drive the change. That's lead the way. And that means it has to start thinking about regulation, but supporting the industry as well. It's not just about big stick. It's about, got to be about carrot and stick. So it's that the government has to drive change and, and lead the way. It can't just um, sort of expect change to happen uh, and, and cross its fingers and hope that it will. So um, 
lead the way is the first one. The second one is actually the government can do a huge amount by the policy that it has in place. There are many things that influence farmer behavior, the market, for example, but a key driver of what farmers do is agricultural policy. And if we change that policy, and that is up for reform in the next few years, if we change that to focus on delivering public goods, we will be putting people on a different path. And then the third thing is actually we need sort of a comprehensive package so that we're helping the industry to facilitate change. So huge challenge for agriculture, but we do need the government to uh, step up. Now I've got two, last, two slides and then I'm done. So the, last, the second last here is on afforestation. The Committee on Climate Change was saying that actually we need to see a big expansion of, of woodland and forestry. So we expect to see that and, and in lots of ways that's, that would be a fantastic thing. There is though a challenge. So what we need to do is, is sort of ask questions, well, what sort of woodland and where? The last time we saw planting rates that of the level that we're expected to see to, to meet net zero, we ended up with the flow country and we spent the last two decades trying to rectify the problems that were created at that time. So we have to be really careful about how we're doing it. So yes, woodland expansion, but let's just be careful about what sort of new woodland we're going to be planting and where it goes. So we want to see actually a greater emphasis on native woodland. So the balance of woodland planting shifted for, um, back towards coniferous productive con conifer woodland um, under the last uh, current SRDP. Um, so that um, is something that we would like to see more of is, is shifting it a bit back towards native woodland. We need to see actually you know, the, the opportunities of, of natural regeneration and that links with the next point, which is doing something about deer and, and implementing the uh, findings of the independent deer working group, which reported earlier in the year. And then um, the final point is actually we need to be strategic about what we do in, in land use change. We sh if we just leave it to the market, we could end up with, with a very sort of disorganized change. But if we can think about well, what, it, what can the land deliver, how can we optimise the use of the land, then we need a sort of a regional sort of planning approach. And so the Scottish Government is moving forward with regional land use partnerships and frameworks and that's something that's positive that we want to see. And then my final slide is around peatlands. It's a huge, huge opportunity in, in peatlands in Scotland. We have large areas of peatland and recently the Scottish Government has done a very good thing in, in its, its identified that it wants to spend £250 million over the next 10 years in peatland restoration. But even again Scottish Government figures that doesn't go quite far enough because it, it, the rule of thumb for, uh, for the cost of peatland restoration is approximately £1,000 a hectare. So you, you're approximately um, uh, restoring about 25,000 hectares a year or 250,000 hectares over 10 years yet the government says there's 600,000 hectares of degraded peatland in Scotland so we have still it's fantastic first step we still have a way to go so we need to be thinking about restoring all peatland because it's storing carbon and it's really important in our, in our efforts to meet net zero but if we're investing all this money in restoring peatland then we do need actually a coherent set of policies because we shouldn't be allowing other things which are degrading peatland which then lead to the need for restoration to carry on so actually we should be thinking about doing things like banning burning and peatlands ending horticultural peat extraction and coming with that has to be some sort of um, end to the sale of peat so you don't just offshore our peat consumption if you like and then there's an issue around um, dealing with the changing nature of uh, moorlands because in some places where you've had forestry planting you have an invasive self-established uh, woodlands getting um, changing moorland so moorland that that is becoming woodland because of coniferous plantations and then setting seed on moorland and that's a potential issue because it will release the carbon from those bogs so then if we want to think about that then we have to think about well what can we invest in can we invest in helping uh, people move away from sort of peak consumption in uh, horticulture and gardening and so on um, and how are we going to invest in in uh, restoring all of the peatlands that we have in Scotland. So there's opportunities there. Uh, there's more that we can do, but there's opportunities for how we spend money in helping farming in, in uh, planting trees and restoring peatlands. So um, thank you for listening. Uh, so I've whistled through that and I hope it has um, uh, sort of got across some of those points and I've just included my email address if anyone would like to um, get in touch. Thank you, I'll stop there. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, I'm going to pass straight on to 
Hello everyone and thank you so much for the opportunity to talk about what Nourish sees as crucial to Scotland's response to the climate emergency. I absolutely echo and applaud uh, what Andrew was saying beforehand and um, absolutely um, if I'm sure if we were in a room there would be massive applause from everyone who's sitting here. So the numbers are important but the problem with numbers reducing everything down to how many kilograms of carbon dioxide equivalent we are saving is only part of the picture. The nature emergency is very real and connected to the climate emergency, as is the health and well-being and culture of Scotland's people and people around the world. And it is only by seeing these things in the round that it is possible to fully appreciate the trade-offs because there are trade-offs. And that is how we ensure some form of justice. This sole focus on carbon emissions is one of the issues that we have with the elements of the Committee on Climate Change's report, because it doesn't think about the culture of Scotland. It doesn't think about the biodiversity of Scotland at all. But we also think that we as a nation in Scotland are missing a trick. Food produces over 30%, 37% of emissions, and yet at a policy level, we rarely discuss it. Instead, we reduce things down to agriculture, to marine, to forestry, to land use. Food is something we need every day, and for the lucky ones, enjoy multiple times a day. The COVID crisis has brought home just how much more necessary food is than the latest fashion, the coolest gin, the smartest watch. Because previously, it was all these other things that we were all consistently happy to spend money on, and yet food needed to be cheap. For poor people, but why on earth should poor people eat cheap food? Why should their already compromised health be further complicated by increased pesticide and antibiotic residues, highly processed and laden in sugar and salt? The pandemic has also reminded us about how our health and the health of our loved ones is paramount to our happiness and our well-being. But once we go beyond the hand washing and the social distancing of the current emergency, we have to remember that much of our health is based on what we eat. So if we do go back to the numbers, did you know that the NHS across the UK is responsible for over 5% of total UK emissions? That's just a bit less than aviation. And those numbers don't go anywhere near capturing the impacts of the medical and other waste, or the fact that three and a half percent of traffic on our roads is connected to the NHS. So, I suggest it begs the question, what is agriculture and land use for? Is it to provide financial returns for multinational faceless organisations and as a pawn in trade deals? Or is it to provide nourishment and fibre for us to be sustained, clothed and housed? Is wheat just a commodity or the key ingredient in our daily bread? Are cows simply burping machines providing us with excess calories or are they integral parts of upland systems that provide the most available source of iron when eaten in moderation? Did you know that nearly half of teenage girls in the UK don't have enough iron? I'm not talking about some other foreign country, I'm talking about here in the UK. Our vegetables, just the garnish on our plates to make it look pretty and they're getting scraped in the bin. Or are they fundamental? to the good health of our guts and our emotional states. The question of vegetable production and consumption has huge questions about offshoring our emissions and about fairness. A third of the UK's fruit and veg supply comes from countries particularly vulnerable to climate change. Over half of our fruit and veg comes from countries facing high or extremely high levels of water scarcity. These figures don't take into account the plastic waste, the overnutrification of soils and water, the numbers of poor, malnourished people growing this veg and fruit for us, who are in the vast majority black or brown. This colonial vision of exploitation needs to be properly confronted. We can produce wonderful, diverse veg here in Scotland with a bit of effort. This joined up thinking, health, poverty, water and air quality and all the other trade-offs could be captured with an integrated food policy. 
Potentially, through the lens of a green recovery, we have an even greater potential to bring these strands together. Because green no longer means recycling a couple of bottles and reusing a carrier bag. Now, it means climate justice, racial justice, gender justice, poverty justice, and tackling the nature emergency. Because we are part of one system, one planet, one community. And food is the intersection of these strands. But let me stop talking in big pictures and provide some tactile suggestions. One, create an integrated food policy, food policy for Scotland. So we had the Good Food Nation Bill and the Circular Economy Bills on the table before the crisis. And I would really urge them to come back. This is the beginning of joined up thinking. In the meantime, we are calling for a national food plan as part of the agriculture bill that MSPs are considering at the moment. There has to be recognition that the market does not provide the outcomes we need as a society when it comes to food. We are food citizens, not just consumers. In fact, enshrining the, food to, the right to food in Scots law is what is needed to really tackle the inequalities in the system. Two, change the narrative on food. Stop the meat versus vegan argument because it isn't doing anyone any favours. For example, while the number of people signing up to veganry, and I can't even say that word, increased by over 1,500%, sales of vegetables in January declined by 6.5% in the same period. The lack of vegetables in our diets is causing almost 21,000 premature deaths in the UK every year. And the vilification of farmers is only further pressurizing a section of society who are battling with low incomes, as shown in Andrew's graph, huge debt, climate risky jobs, and the knowledge that everything they have been told to do for the last 40 years is now wrong. Of course, there are massive changes that land managers must make, but we need to remember that the current business models are built on structures put in place by our policies and our common bowing to the motivation of cheap food and profit. We need to support farmers as we transition together to a better place. Make our farming, land and marine management about nourishment, nourishing the soil and moving to an agroecological system means cleaner air, cleaner water, cleaner health, healthier ecosystems and healthier people. And three, grasp the opportunity of local food. Nourish's first ever strapline was a Scotland where in every region we eat more of what we produce and we produce more of what we eat. The current exponential growth and demand for veg boxes shows that local is important to rural and urban communities in terms of access to food, availability of food and diversity of product, all of which is key to resilience because climate change will continue to interrupt international supply chains. For me, the nub of local is the heightened element of relationship. Good relationships are the basis of trust, and so many of the issues with our current food system are about a lack of trust. We need a system in Scotland that doesn't determine success in terms of scale, but instead stimulates smaller processing facilities, smaller machinery, smaller farms, smaller shops, and collaboration to create strong relationships and trust across the system. Part of the solution is to quite simply remove the minimum three hectare farm size outside crofting areas. This will be more inclusive of those who don't have access to large tracts of land, inclusive of urban and peri-urban growing, inclusive of diversity, and that's diversity from the crops being grown, the animals being grown, and the people growing them. That means more women, more young people, and more people of colour being recognised as part and valuable part of that system. So to conclude, if we reduce climate change to just carbon emissions, reduce food to just calories, reduce agriculture to single commodities, we miss out the fact that we are human, complex, and part of a beautiful dynamic ecosystem. I'm not suggesting this is easy, but our policies need to encompass this complexity to create a just future for all of us. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Keisha. Um, Callum, how are we doing? Are we ready to go? <laughs> well, thank you very much, Keisha. That was brilliant. I appreciate you 
stepping in there. I wasn't so trying to give you an, an overview of Marine without the pictures. I can share them afterwards. <laughs> um, uh, basically, uh, we, we're on planet ocean here. Uh, the, the, the ocean uh, has absorbed 90% of the heat and over a third of all the carbon dioxide that humans have produced and provides uh, over half of all the oxygen that we breathe as well. Uh, but in the global context, our seas are highly impacted. Uh, the seas around uh, the UK, the North Sea, are amongst the most impacted on the planet. A study for OSPAR showed that 74% uh, uh, of all the grid cells in the Northeast Atlantic area are continuously year on year impacted by fisheries and the other 26% are uh, uh, impacted as well, albeit not as, not as frequently. Uh, by every uh, measure of um, targets that we have, the Convention on Biological Diversity, uh, requirement to uh, halt the loss of biodiversity by 2020, uh, to meet uh, good environmental status under the Marine Strategy Framework by 2020, to achieve sustainable fisheries by 2020. We're failing against uh, all those metrics. Uh, 11 of 14 qualitative descriptors for uh, Marine Strategy Framework Directive are, uh, uh, we have not met the targets for those. Now, there, there's been, marine conservation progress in Scotland. Uh, there's a network of marine protected areas and a national marine plan. The ne network of marine protected areas covers something like 25% of our seas, but only a small proportion of them are currently protected uh, adequately from the most damaging pressure, which is fishing. And uh, you know, the National Marine Plan has at its core the requirement to meet uh, sustainable development uh, goals. Progress to deliver protection for MPAs is, is delayed, it has been delayed. We've, it's welcome that we have over 2,200 kilometres squared of uh, inshore marine protected area protected. Um, and that's following consultation a few years ago. But most of the MPA sites currently don't have protection measures in place. Why is this a concern? Uh, it's a concern because we're only just starting to understand the potential blue carbon sequestration value of many of these habitats. Uh, seagrass beds, for example, uh, are 35 times more efficient than tropical rainforests at locking up carbon. And studies are showing increasingly the, uh, the value of uh, our, our sediments for locking up carbon. The top 10 centimetres of sediment in our uh, nearshore seabed lock up more uh, carbon dioxide than our peatlands. But we're only just beginning to scratch the surface as to um, the role and the value of these uh, sediment habitats and these other habitats in terms of locking up uh, carbon. So there's an opportunity here. We have to look at uh, the future of managing our seabed and a big part of that is looking at improving fisheries management. Uh, Scotland's Marine Atlas, National Marine Plan, uh, Peter Thompson, the UN Special Envoy for the Ocean, uh, the UN IPBES report, report after report, indicate that f overfishing is the single biggest uh, impactor on the health of our oceans alongside climate change itself. And there's a vicious circle there because overfished oceans are less resilient uh, to climate change. So we need to be uh, looking very carefully at the future, future of fisheries management in Scotland so that we put uh, 
the recovery and the health of nature at the, at the absolute core of fisheries management. It's not just about the marine protected areas. We need to get those better managed. We need to improve their management. Uh, but it's about looking at uh, nature and climate friendly fishing throughout Scotland's seas. And uh, what we need is fully documented fisheries, fishing sustainably. We need uh, remote electronic monitoring on all vessels so we know what boats are fishing for what and where they are fishing. To date, with the MPA work that I've been talking about, but also wider marine planning, and I would say it would also apply to other issues like aquaculture, the pattern to date has been trying to fit in conservation measures around existing patterns of use. And what we need to be doing is we need to be flipping that on its head. And we, mean, we need to be managing our sea and seabed with the grain of the ecosystem. So we need to be, uh, we, we need to be looking uh, from the seabed upwards. We need to be looking at what role all the habitats on the seabed play, including in carbon sequestration and in matching um, fishing effort and opportunity uh, according to what parts of the seabed best can take those different types of fishing gear. And the Blue Carbon Forum are doing a very good job uh, at doing a number of PhDs that are looking very closely at all those issues. In terms of um, energy offshore, Obviously, offshore wind is a big part of, uh, you know, a big part of the solution to uh, mitigating the impacts of climate change. But we need to make sure we'll be, we're getting these installations in the right place. We can't be putting them in any any remaining pristine areas of seabed, uh, and there'll only be those net benefits for biodiversity and climate if they're placed in suitable areas that are maybe already diminished or degraded. So what we need, what we need to do going forward, what we're urge going forward is integration. We need we need integration of fisheries management with marine planning. We need um, uh, we need resources to make sure that we get marine planning systems in place. We're still several years behind in delivering regional marine planning. We need whatever comes out the future of fisheries management process to actually. Uh, ensure we have a, a just transition to, to zero carbon fishing, where we have remote electronic monitoring on all boats, where we explore um, greener fuels, lighter gears, and uh, a more sustainable use, particularly of the inshore of our marine area, to deliver maximum value to society as a whole, not just for blue carbon benefits, but uh, for all the other benefits to society as well in terms of recreation and well-being. So there's an opportunity of the future of fisheries management. Uh, there's, a, there's work currently ongoing looking at improving the protection of priority marine features outside MPAs. Some of those are blue carbon stores. We need to think progressively about this. Uh, so from MCS and Scottish Environment Link perspective, we would like to see a presumption against uh, heavy trawling and dredging in a large and significant part of the inshore area of Scotland's seas, and that would enable uh, the, the recovery of many of the, the vulnerable habitats like seagrass beds, merle beds, horse mussel beds, kelp forests that are so important for uh, locking up carbon and providing all these other benefits. But we also need to look at active restoration and unlocking investment to help that active restoration take place. We're a partner with uh, Glen Morangie and Heriot Watt University with the uh, uh, Dornick Environment Enhancement Project, exciting project to reintroduce native oysters uh, into Dornick Firth. There's a lot of work to be done to unlock that supply chain of native oyster spat. We also need to be looking at um, proactive seagrass restoration as well. But all, all this needs investment. In short, we need transformative change. Business as usual has got us to where we are, we need to do business differently post-climate biodiversity and COVID emergencies. 
we need to break the false dichotomy between jobs versus conservation and we need to uh, put in place management and conservation that leads to the recovery and restoration of our seabed. Thank you. Thanks so much and thank you to all three of our speakers covering a really wide range of topics. 